Going twice. Okay, if there are no questions, let's thank Alexander again. Okay, the final talk of this session is by me. Um, and I'll begin as soon as my slides appear on the screen. All right, thank you. So, uh, my name is Jordan Maraca. I'm a postdoc at UCLA, uh, where I work as part of the NAS group, uh, led by Jack Burns at Colorado. Um, and today, I want to tell you about um, why now is a really exciting time to do low-frequency observations from the moon. Um, this has uh, been the case for a long time. Um, but recently, um, because of this measurement by the EDGES collaboration, which you're seeing here on my title slide, it's an even more exciting time than ever uh, to do uh, observations from the lunar far side because they have the potential to settle a really interesting dispute that's going on in the community right now. So in the next 12 minutes, I'm going to try to tell you uh, what this signal is uh, and how lunar observations can uh, help settle the score. Um, so I'm going to start at the end and in one busy slide try to give you the skeleton for this entire talk. Okay. Um, so I suspect that most of you do not spend your time thinking about this uh, so-called global 21 centimeter signal, which is the one that's recently been detected. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, you can think of it as a probe of the thermal history of the very early universe. Okay? And on one prediction for the signal is shown in blue at the right. Now, uh, recently, uh, the first reported detection of the signal was announced uh, of a signal at 80 megahertz. And while this is roughly in the right ballpark of what we were expecting, the signal is uh, more than twice as large as we thought it should be. Um, and that's not really a shortcoming of an imagination. It's really twice as strong as the, the maximum allowed amplitude uh, that we thought the signal could take on. Okay, so this is a really startling result. Um, and it's led to a lot of activity in the field trying to understand uh, what could be going on. Um, one of the main explanations is that there could be some new, uh, perhaps exotic physics um, uh, in terms of dark matter interacting with baryons or, or perhaps other things. And I'll come back to that. Um, and I think in order to figure out what's going on, we really need observations at very low frequencies. Okay, so this signal, though it can be explained through exotic physics, um, it could have more mundane explanations having to do with kind of run-of-the-mill astrophysics that we just haven't thought hard enough about. But if we try to measure the signal uh, during epochs when astrophysics hasn't really started, which is to say, you know, times before the first stars and galaxies form in the universe, we can really isolate um, the physics from the astrophysics. Uh, but to do that, we need to observe at frequencies below about 30 megahertz, which, as you might know, is roughly the uh, point where the Earth's ionosphere becomes opaque uh, to low-frequency radiation. Okay, so to do that, we need to, to do these measurements, we need to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Okay, so now back to the bigger picture. Uh, of what we're doing. Um, this is the cartoon picture we show at the beginning of basically all of our talks in this field, and it depicts structure formation in the early universe, starting with the microwave background all the way on the left, uh, and modern day on the right-hand side. And so early on, the universe was a pretty, uh, pretty dark, uh, pretty uneventful place. Um, after the microwave background radiation was emitted, uh, the universe was basically dark, and just uh, cosmic expansion uh, was going, the gas was cooling. Um, uh, but in time, uh, small density perturbations grew, and that's when the first stars formed in the universe, which are depicted in this cartoon by these little specks of light. And we'd very much like to know what's going on with these little specks of light. These are sort of the birthplaces of uh, galaxies and black holes in the universe. Um, but they're very difficult to see individually, uh, just because they're so distant uh, and faint. Um, but collectively, they have an enormous in impact on the intergalactic medium, okay, which is depicted here in, by these bubbles, which represent uh, big... Um, uh, H2 bubbles, so ionized hydrogen gas, um, which have been ionized by the sources that live within them. Okay? And so though we can't see the sources directly, we can see uh, the neutral hydrogen gas outside of these bubbles uh, through the 21 centimeter transition in the ground state of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so the whole game in this field is to try and to learn about structure formation in the early universe through studying the intergalactic medium um, because it's just difficult to see the sources themselves. Um, and now, in principle, you could try to make maps uh, of this field of bubbles, um, and people are trying to do that. Um, in my talk today, I'm going to be talking about this global 21 centimeter signal, which is uh, ignoring the spatial dimension here, and just leveraging the fact that we're studying uh, a line, okay? which means that each observed frequency maps back onto a, a unique time in, in the universe's evolution. Okay? So as we tune our telescopes uh, to lower and lower frequencies, we're seeing higher and higher redshifts or earlier and earlier times in the universe. 
Um, so to cartoonify uh, that cartoon even further, um, uh, it's basically, you know, we have some telescope on the ground, which is shown here at the right, and it's looking along sight lines to the microwave background, and in between us and the microwave background are clouds of neutral hydrogen gas. And those atoms have, you know, some level populations in the ground state that determine how bright of an absorption or emission signal we see. Uh, so to quantify that a little bit, this is uh, an expression uh, called the differential brightness temperature. And it's really just how bright is that hydrogen relative to the backlight, which is the CMB. Okay, so and intuitively it depends on uh, how neutral that gas is. Um, so it's easy to think about this in the sort of opposite case. If the gas is ionized um, and the neutral fraction is zero, we don't see anything at all. Okay, it's transparent, we just see the background. Um, in principle, it depends on the de uh, density, but we're going to be averaging over large scales, uh, in which case that's zero. And then very importantly, this quantity called the spin temperature. Okay? And so the spin temperature just quantifies uh, the sort of relative number of hydrogen atoms in each of these spin states. Okay? And again, that determines how strong of a, a signal we see and whether it's in absorption or emission. Um, and so this depends on things you might expect, like the density. Um, and the temperature, because through collisions we can exchange, uh, you know, kind of a spin up, spin up situation for a, an anti-alignment uh, configuration. Um, but it also depends on uh, the presence of any background radiation fields, which I'll come back to in just a second. So it's, it's useful to think uh, about a, a simplified example in which there is no astrophysics, okay? We just consider a big block of the universe that has some density, and it's just uh, expanding uh, with time and cooling. Um, and so I'm going to show you how a few quantities play out in this slide. The top panel is uh, the ionization history, which you've probably seen before. So cosmological recombination occurs a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, uh, and the, the medium goes from being ionized to quite neutral. At the same time, uh, the CMB uh, background radiation field is cooling, um, and for a time anyways, the gas temperature remains the same as the CMB temperature. And that's just because Compton scattering between photons and free electrons can exchange energy and kind of equilibrate these temperatures. Uh, but eventually as the CMB cools, uh, that Compton scattering fails to keep these temperatures the same. And we have the gas actually cooling faster than the CMB. So the, this means there's an opportunity to see a difference uh, between uh, the backlight and neutral hydrogen gas, provided that the spin temperature of hydrogen is the same as the kinetic temperature of hydrogen. And in fact, we expect that to be the case for at least uh, some small amount of time, um, basically because collisions are still effective at, uh, in the early universe. So just collisions between hydrogen atoms can force the spin temperature to be the kinetic temperature. And so we should see a dip in the sky averaged brightness temperature just due to this decoupling. Um, but the universe keeps expanding. Uh, it's going to keep expanding and keep expanding, and so those collisions eventually become negligible as well, and the signal tends back towards zero. Okay, so this is a bit of a long-winded preamble, um, but I think it's necessary uh, to describe uh, what I'll say next, uh, which has to do with edges. Okay, so edges re recently reported this detection at 80 megahertz, uh, which is in this gray band here. And so you might be wondering after all of this why we'd expect a signal in that band at all. Um, and this is where astrophysics uh, enters the signal. Um, so once the first sources of light turn on, uh, they emit UV photons. Um, and the intergalactic medium is very opaque to UV photons, particularly Lyman alpha photons. Okay, so as these photons redshift and cascade through the Lyman series, spontaneous absorption and re-emission of photons can actually flip uh, the hyperfine spin states. Okay, so this provides a new coupling mechanism in the high redshift intergalactic medium. Um, and this is pretty cool. Um, without this, we would expect only a very weak signal at late times. Um, and it's cool because uh, basically when the first stars form up, uh, turn on, uh, that's interesting in its own right, but they also tell you what the temperature of the intergalactic medium is, okay? Um, and that temperature, because it's cold for the reasons I just talked about, is still going to be colder than the CMB. And so we get yet another uh, absorption signal relative to the CMB, though at higher frequency. That's this guy here. Okay. Now... Uh, after the first stars turn on, this becomes kind of a mess. And depending on what we think about how galaxies form, the features of the signal can move all over the place. And so the, the game in this field, we thought, anyways, until recently, was going to be to try to measure the features of the signal and to kind of reverse engineer what the, proper, the parameters of galaxy formation must be. Um, but importantly, you'll notice in all of this that this feature at very low frequencies stays the same. Okay? 
And that's because it's just at such early times that stars haven't formed yet and they can't influence the signal, okay? Okay, so let's talk about edges. So on March 1st of this year, it was announced uh, by this team that you know, they detected something at about 78 megahertz, which is about the right frequencies for the astrophysical signal, but it's much too strong, okay? Um, so there's been a flurry of activity that I'll talk about next in just a minute, um, but just to show you what edges look like, looks like, it's kind of a picnic-sized table thing sitting in the outback of Western Australia. Um, and I want you to notice, uh, oops, uh, the units here, this is a weak signal. Um, here it's measured in units of Kelvin, and the amplitude of the signal is something like half of a Kelvin. Now this is small um, because the signal is sitting behind uh, an immense galactic foreground. I don't have time to go into the difficulty of this problem uh, right now, but suffice it to say it's challenging. And so I would encourage you to go talk to Keith and David who are sitting in the back who have uh, some posters describing in more detail how one might extract this signal uh, from the foreground. Um, but I'm gonna completely sweep that under the rug for the next two minutes and talk about the theoretical interpretations of the signal because that's really what motivates even more than usual why we need to go to the moon, okay? Uh, so just to orient you here, I've, I've replotted the edges signal now with frequency on the x-axis instead of redshift. Okay, so this is the 50 to 100 megahertz range. And I'll just point out some things that may be familiar to you, to you, like the FM radio band, which straddles the high frequency edge of the edges band, um, and the ionospheric cutoff, which is about 30 megahertz. Okay. Now, the region I've just um, added cross-hatching to is the region that we thought it was impossible for there to be a signal in, in standard cosmological models. And that's basically because in the standard cosmology, we know what the coldest temperature the, the intergalactic medium can be is at any given redshift, okay? It's just been cooling since recombination. Um, so the signal that was measured is stronger than we would have thought, which means, naively, that, that the gas must be colder than we thought it could be, okay? At least that's the first idea that came out of this field. So you can uh, scratch your head, as many people did after this result came out, and ask, well, what do we have to change in order to get a signal this strong, okay? And the, uh, I'm running out of time here, but I'm almost to the end. Um, the first thing you can look at is the spin temperature and say, are there ways I could make this smaller than we'd expect, okay? And one answer is, if baryons and dark matter interact in some way, um, the baryons can use the dark matter as a heat sink of sorts, okay, and transfer some of their energy to the dark matter uh, while themselves uh, cooling a little bit more. Uh, you could also be wrong about the backlight, okay? Maybe it's not just the CMB. Maybe there's some exotic decaying particle in the early universe that kind of amplifies what we thought of as the backlight, which would bias your signal to larger amplitudes. Or you could uh, screw around with these cosmological terms. That's a little trickier because you have to contend with pretty tight constraints on things like the microwave background itself. Um, and, and these aren't even all of the ideas, okay? I've been tracking this roughly on the archive. There have been 40-some papers to come out in the last three months, months, which is quite a bit of activity for our little field. Um, but those three ideas really only constitute about half of the ideas that are out there to uh, explain some or all of the signal. Um, and just before I put up my conclusion slide, um, I'm the chair, so I get to take as much time as I want, right? Um, I just want to re-emphasize uh, this importance of the very low frequency part of the signal, okay? So what I've shown you here are a couple models, all of which have the same signal at cosmic dawn, like the one edge is measured, that's what I'm showing you in gray. Um, but in the dark ages, they're completely distinct, okay? And that's just because degeneracies between the particle physics, for example, and the astrophysics here can conspire to give you signals that all look identical. But at the early times where there is no astrophysics, uh, the fundamental physics reveals itself, okay? And so we're putting together a, a mission concept called DAPR, which is led by Jack Burns. Um, and the goal is to detect this very low frequency part of the signal to try to learn something about exotic physics uh, and then put this picture to the test. Okay, and with that, I will end where I started and take any questions you might have. Thank you. So, Jordan, can you say a little bit more about what this implies about the nature of, of dark matter? Um, so, have we, you know, have, have physicists been looking at the wrong place for dark matter so far? Does this give broader insight into how uh, we can 
do some experiments, but because of course the physics community is very frustrated not having mm -hmm. actually detected this dark matter, which is yeah. supposed to be the dominant matter uh, in the universe according to us astronomers. Yeah, so it's potentially a very important piece of the puzzle. Uh, so physicists are basically looking for dark matter in places where they know how to detect things, right? There's no physically motivated prior for what the properties of dark matter should be. Uh, I don't have a plot handy, but typically people look at things in sort of mass cross-section space. And these measurements do carve out a region in that parameter space that is not accessed by any experiments, at least that I know of right now. Um, but it depends on what you assume about the kind of interaction between dark matter and baryons, if there is such a thing. Uh, the type of interaction that's been assumed so far is actually, uh, you know, Rutherford scattering, which is to say that dark, uh, dark matter could have a very small electric charge, uh, which gives you a cross-section that depends on the velocity, the minus fourth power, okay? And um, for certain regions in that parameter space, this kind of works out, but one of the very interesting things that has already been revealed is in fact, if this is your explanation for the edge of signal, not all of the dark matter can be of this kind of milli-charged variety because it screws up other independent constraints. Okay? So if that holds, that's a very profound thing. It would suggest that dark matter isn't just one thing. Um, so, I, so I think, yeah, this is a very interesting thing and potentially you know, going to frequencies where we don't have to worry about the astrophysics and how marginalizing over the things we don't know there um, affects our conclusions, I mean, that's super exciting, so. Any more questions? If not, I will invite the rest of the panel to join me. <laughs> if, uh, I don't know if we should interpret the lack of questions after the